was interviewed by a Los Angeles examiner and stated, For those of you who followed the Taylor case in all its intensity, undoubtedly realize what I went through. I was the last person known to have seen him alive. I was interviewed, questioned, had statements taken by stenographers, was harassed by the newspaper men, until I was forced to move into the country and was on the verge of nervous prostration. Detectives and district attorneys swarmed around me, and my name was flaunted on the front pages of every newspaper in the country for weeks. It was a terrible experience. As I look back on it now, I don't blame them so much. They wanted to find out who perpetrated this atrocious murder, and they were leaving no stone unturned that might have hit a clue. But at this time, I did blame them. I thought it was terribly unfair. I was doing everything I could to help authorities, but no one would give me credit whatsoever. And that is why I want to say right here that there is no person in the world who will be as glad as Mabel Norman when the murders of Bill Taylor are brought to justice. As with many actors and actresses in Hollywood, then and now, getting the true dates, ages, and biographical information can be a challenge. Mabel Norman was no different. The information presented here comes from newspaper items, articles, interviews, and books about Mabel. Mabel was born November 9, 1892 in Staten Island, New York. I had found November 10, 1894 as her birth date, too. There are also conflicting places as to where she was born. Some say Boston, Massachusetts, Providence, Rhode Island, Atlanta, Georgia, and Quebec. In an interview, Mabel had said she had always been uncertain about these two facts, and that to her, neither were very important. Her parents were Claude G. Norman, of French descent, and her mother, Mary Drury, of Irish descent. Claude was an excellent pianist, and this was how he made a meager living for his family. Mabel was one of six children born to the Normans. Three of the children died at a young age. The remaining three were Claude Jr., Mabel, and Gladys. Mabel never went to school. Her mother found time to teach the children to read and write while she continued with such work as patching and mending clothes to bring in more money. When her father was at home, he taught her how to cultivate her voice. She was a beautiful singer. At the age of 13, she needed to help the family earn more money. She boarded the ferry boat and headed to the Butterick Company. Her mother said that they would hire young girls to work in the pattern mailing department. When she entered the department, the clerk, a kind middle-aged man, told her she was too pretty to work in this department. He gave her a note to see Carl Kleinschmidt in the art department. He engaged her for about an hour and told her she would make 50 cents an hour. If he did not require her services on that certain day, he would give her a note of introduction to other artists who might employ her. She modeled for the likes of Charles Gibson, Orson Lowell, Henry Hutt, and others. She modeled for a variety of products, such as hats, furs, jewelry, umbrellas, creams, shoes, and plenty of others. Her family was more happy with the money she was bringing in. 
She also met Alice Joyce, Justine Johnson, and Anna Q. Nielsen. It was Alice Joyce who told her about working for the movies. Frank Lanning, a model and sometimes actor, told Mabel she should go to the Biograph Studios and ask for D.W. Griffith for work. Finally, she did just that and met Griffith's right-hand man, Wilfred Lucas, who sent her to wardrobe. Work went on late that night. She received $10 and Mabel hurried home, where her mother was very angry. Mabel gave her the $10 and her mother forbade her from ever working at Biograph again. At some point, her mother gave in to Mabel's wanting to act and allowed her to return to Biograph. Griffith would go on to direct Mabel in The Squaw's Love, Saved from Himself, and The Eternal Mother. Mabel would also go on to perform her own stunts. She was very athletic and an excellent swimmer. In all the shorts and features she would make during her film career, she rarely, if ever, used a stunt double. She was a risk taker, both on and off the screen. So she has no idea her actual birth date? Supposedly, yes. And where, or where she was born. Yes. That is so odd to me. Like, I feel like that would be something you would ask your parents. Or maybe they just always, they couldn't remember. I mean, it's possible. I mean, that is so but, strange. Yeah. But, you know, they also, who knows, at the time, you know, people fudged the dates on their birthdays and stuff like that. So maybe oh. it was a way of change. I mean, I don't understand why it would be that she would need to change the place. But, yeah, that's you know, the weird. year I could understand. Yeah, but, right, right, right. You know. Yeah. I mean, so how old was she when she was being a model? She started at 13. At 13. Wow. Mm -hmm. That seems weird. Yeah. Seems sketchy. Well. I mean, you know, I mean, just the whole situation. Yeah, but I mean, at that time, there weren't like the labor laws for children and stuff like that. Right. So, no, that's true. That's true. You know, you had to do what you had to do to survive. Yeah. So. But that was crazy. So her parents, her mom didn't want her to continue with acting. She was like, it, you came home at what, like 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock at you night. You came home at 11 o'clock at night. We're not, you're not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm wondering what it was. Like, was it Mabel that actually convinced her? Or was it like the dad going like, you know what? We kind of need this money, you know? <laughs> well, I think, I don't think it was the acting per se that upset the mom. It was the 11 o'clock. She's 13, right. yeah, 11 o'clock, coming home yeah. alone. So, I, you know, I, I think that was the major issue. But mm. I'm sure... Just from all the research that I've done with Mabel or about Mabel, she, you know, she did what she did. She she wanted to do this, so yeah. I don't think her mom had any shot in keeping her away from it, you know? She was probably, Mabel was probably, like, sneaking in. Because at that time, I'm sure studios weren't like, well, did you bring your parents with you? Oh, no. Yeah. I didn't. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. And so, and now, and so she's working at this point now with D.W. Griffith. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, like, before Birth of a Nation and all that fun stuff, right? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. Mm -hmm. At Biograph, Mabel would also meet one of the men who would change her life and career. Max Sennett also worked with D.W. Griffith and took a shine to Mabel. Griffith would take his company to California when the winter season arrived. They would stay in California until May, then return to New York. He didn't ask Mabel to join them. Sennett saw how unhappy she was with the news and told her that he was planning on creating his own company and that maybe she would join him. He also told her that she could find work at Vitagraph Studios until they returned. She worked at Vitagraph making $30 a week. When Griffith returned, he gave Mabel a job again. She stayed with Griffith for about a year. She was 17 at this time. Sennett took her to lunch and discussed future endeavors. He told her that he had signed a contract with Bauman and Kessel, who were from the New York Motion Picture Company. They wanted him to make comedies out in Hollywood, and would she be interested in joining him? Senate took Mabel to Bauman and Kessel's office, where they laid out the plan of how much she would make if she signed with them. When their offers were met with silence, they took it to mean that the money was not enough. That wasn't the issue for Mabel. She was just shocked and going over in her head how much money she would make and how she could take care of her entire family with it. Their last offer, $125 a week, brought her back to reality and she quickly signed on. Keystone Comedies began on July 4th, 1912, filming in Central Park, and in 10 days they would be on their way to Hollywood. 
The movie going public clamored for more comedies and Senate was more than happy to oblige. With, with, with Griffith's pieces, like, you know, I think she also worked at the time when Gish was there, or both Gishes were there. Oh, and I, I think he was more interested in the, the, the meek little woman, you know, striving to survive instead of a wacky kind of oh, okay. Mabel comedy, you know, that she was probably more like. <laughs> right, he wanted more pale and tragic. Yes, and she more was pale and tragic, pale. and she was not pale and tragic, obviously. Well, she might have been pale, but she, I don't think she was tragic, <laughs> at least not yet tragic. Um, so yeah, I guess he felt he didn't need to bring her. He brought, you know, probably... I'm sure it was also not cheap to bring the entire studio right. to California. <laughs> so obviously, it upset her because she was really enjoying what she was doing. But you know, thank goodness for Senate. Um, if this were all, if this is all true, that he told her to go check out Vitagraph. So she, you know, still continued to work. So Vitagraph. Okay. So let's let's get back to Taylor then. Mm -hmm. Taylor was. I can't remember exactly when it was when Taylor was at Vitagraph. I feel like this was before that though. Um, but. So Taylor and Mabel at one point both worked at Vitagraph. Maybe not together, but they both worked at Vitagraph. Well, she worked at Vitagraph in New York, and he was in Vitagraph oh. in, in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. okay, I see, I see. Because we're still in New York. This is more this of is... The, the beginnings of oh, like the, so you know, the film company. So they are still doing majority of their filming in New York. Gotcha, okay. Mm -hmm. Mabel's first Keystone comedy was The Water Nymph. It appeared to be a retelling of the diving girls that she had done at Biograph. She had once again done her own stunts. Keystone would become quite popular and made a lot of money. With more money comes more people demanding higher salaries. Actors Fred Mace and Ford Sterling would end up leaving Keystone when the compensation Senate offered was not to their liking. Needing to replace these two actors, Senate would go on to hire a young Englishman who had never set foot in front of the camera. In September of 1913, Charles Chaplin had been signed to Keystone. The world would not see Chaplin on screen for a whole year afterwards because Senate wanted to make sure Chaplin understood the filmmaking methods he and the veteran actors used. He made his debut in Making a Living, directed by Henry Learman. Senate was not at all pleased with the results, and he felt that he had made a big mistake in signing Chaplin. Mabel saw something more in Chaplin, and argued with Matt about keeping him. Mabel, of course, won the argument. She would go on to be one of the only people at Keystone who befriended and rallied for Chaplin. She would always have a place in Chaplin's heart. Chaplin was not easy to direct, and most directors took issues with him. Senate decided that he would have Mabel direct him in his next film, Mabel at the Wheel. No offense to Mabel, but Chaplin was angered by the idea of a woman who was much younger than he direct him. He wanted to direct himself. Senate would then go on to basically tell Chaplin to do as he says or leave. After the incident, Mac heard from the heads in New York that people wanted more Chaplin films. So Senate bit his lip and became more friendly with Chaplin and allowed him to direct his own films. Chaplin and Mabel would also make up and would go on to star and direct each other in series of one or two reelers. They worked well with one another and made a great pair. Later in life, Chaplin would speak warmly about Mabel. She was lighthearted and gay, a good fellow, kind and generous, and everyone adored her. In December of 1914, Mabel, along with Chaplin and newcomer to films Marie Dressler, would go on to make Tilly's Punctured Romance. The film was a huge success and brought even more notice to Chaplin. He would then go on to request a bigger raise and even more control over production. The heads back in New York, along with Senate, found his request ridiculous and that if he was unhappy, then he can just go on his merry way. So, he did, and the powers that be realized that they made a big mistake. With Chaplin gone, Senate paired Mabel with Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle to begin a new series. The Fatty and Mabel series would begin filming in January of 1915. Like with Chaplin, Senate was apprehensive with Arbuckle. 
But again, like Chaplin, Mabel intervened, and Arbuckle would go on to become one of the most famous comedians, as well as a director of their time. They became more relaxed and confident with their performances, and did well with one another. So she has, so Mabel Norman and <laughs> fights for Chaplin? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, that's kind of a crazy thing. I mean, when yeah. I first was at least learning about Mabel, uh, or at least reading about Mabel, I, I think the Chaplin movie came out. Oh, and Richard they Attenberg's Chaplin. Yeah. make Mabel out to be a miserable person, at least it feels like. Played by Marissa Tomei, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's what, yeah. It, she always seemed like she was complaining. They really made her look like she was just a huge inconvenience to everybody. Yeah. And she was just there because... They had to have her. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, yeah, I remember and Yeah, that. I mean, I and then doing, the, you know, besides research, but also having read more about her since I do love Mabel Norman, I realized all of that was just wrong. I mean, she was a good person. She was a sweet person. And, you know, she, she had this intuition on people. And she could tell that there was something there. Maybe it wasn't on the surface, but that they could be really good. And yeah. I guess she saw that in Chaplin and in Arbuckle. Yeah, and it's funny, too, because I remember reading Chaplin's autobiography, and there was nothing like that about how much he complained about her. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't remember reading anything about him complaining about her, but yet in the film, they made it like, oh, my God. Like, I remember Dan Aykroyd, because he was Max Edit. He was like, oh, my God, Charlie, please have me ha help me, because Mabel actually thinks she can direct. Yeah. And so I'm wondering... It's all wrong. I'm, I'm wondering if it's just Richard Attenberg... At Attenborough. 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 If it's just mis him... Like, once again, going to the misconception that was probably. probably in the tabloids. Or just the fact that she was a woman. Like, just played it out that way. Like, he can't see a woman director or anything like that yeah, as well. I believe so. Oh, shocking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Life for Mabel began to take a turn in September of 1915. There were many different reports on what occurred that resulted in Mabel suffering a concussion and being laid up for weeks. One version is that the injury was sustained when a shoe went flying during a scene and hit Mabel in the head. In an interview, Mabel went on to say that it happened due to Arbuckle accidentally sitting on her head. According to Minta Durfee, Arbuckle's wife, and friend to Mabel, she walked in on Senate, who she was engaged to, and actress Mae Bush in a compromising position. Mae Bush then picked up a vase and hurled it at Mabel. It struck her in the head and caused her to bleed severely. Whether or not May knew it was Mabel is unknown. Lastly, Adela Roger St. John would go on to say that Mabel tried to kill herself by jumping off the pier. Depression had come over Mabel when she caught Senate in bed with May Bush, thus ending their engagement shortly before they were to be wed. And the forgiveness and reuniting Senate desperately wanted would not come to be. In December of the same year, Mabel would be hurt on the job. This event did take place on set. Again, whether the story was concocted by Senate publicity or actually happened is unclear. But this is what has been said. Mabel and actor Chester Conklin were in an airplane filming a scene. When taking off, Conklin released the throttle and the plane came crashing down and exploded into flames. Neither star was seriously hurt though rested for several days. Mabel never seemed to be the same girl after all this emotional and physical pain that she had endured. It is sad knowing everything else that would be thrown at her in the coming years. How she started out a strong woman that was ahead of her time and how life had beaten her down. She didn't deserve any of this. One good thing that did happen for Mabel in that same year the motion picture magazine took a poll, and Mabel was voted best female comedian. Okay, so at this point now, so Chaplin is clearly, obviously, a big deal now, mm -hmm. and the he wants more money. Of course, he got he's able to direct. Him mm -hmm. and Mabel are directing each other. Mm -hmm. uh, he's able to direct, so he wants more money, wants more control. Yes. I imagine. Yes. And the uh, the powers that be. The heads of that of Senate studios or so forth said no. Yes. They probably were the last people to ever say no to Charlie Chaplin. Probably, yeah. <laughs> and they really regretted it. And so and off he went. And off he went. Okay, so 
So there's no more chaplain. No more chaplain. It's just, it's now, they bring in Arbuckle. Arbuckle's brought in to pair with Mabel, yes. Who said it also doesn't like. <laughs> like with yes. Chaplin. It's just yeah. like, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. And Mabel's the one that's like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, let's stick with him. Yes. Okay. It's so, I feel like Senate is just such a bad judge of character. It sounds like it. Yeah. The only you know? good thing he did was pick Mabel. Right. Yeah. His only good decision. Because mm -hmm. afterwards, it sounds like it's just awful, his choices. Because mm -hmm. So they, they're in a relationship. Mm -hmm. They're together. Mm -hmm. They get engaged. Mm -hmm. And then she gets hurt. And it's supposedly because he's having a fling with someone. Mm -hmm. Mabel catches him. The woman he's with. Um, May, Bush. May Bush. May Bush. Throws a vase at her head. Supposedly. I mean, these are all gossip things. So this it's, is gossip you know, things. So we knows? don't know. We don't know. Yeah. But we do know, it's probably obvious, the fact that she did catch Senate with her, though. Yes. And that's why the engagement was off and mm -hmm. they were done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so she's depressed. Nothing's going right. She gets an award, right? Or she's voted the she's, best female comedian. Yes. Okay, so that's hopefully going to spring her back up. and One would hope. Okay, get her back up hope. and going. Yeah. In the winter of 1916, Mabel, fed up with Senate, left him. Since day one, he worked Mabel very hard and paid her a very low wage, knowing full well that she was a huge star and deserved far more. Also, the control he held over all her films was stifling her ability to be creative and spread her wings. At first, he acted as though she would be easy to replace. Then he heard that Thomas Ince wanted her to work for him and would offer her her own studio. Senate, panic-stricken, talked to the powers that be, and he offered her her own film company as well as a studio of her own. She happily agreed, and in April of 1916, the short-lived Mabel Norman Film Company was born. Mabel could choose her own material and people. She began work on Mickey. This would be the first feature-length comedy to give billing to a single comedian. Chaplin would not get his first solo feature until three years after Mickey. Unfortunately, the movie had been shelved for about a year after it was completed. Mabel was growing tired with Senate and ended up signing a five-year contract with Samuel Goldwyn. Once Mickey was finally premiered in 1918, it was an immediate success. When Mabel started working for Goldwyn, she was exhausted from bouts of illness but the rumor was that it may have been drug use. Like Wallace Reed, she was given medicine to aid her in recovering from being ill. Unfortunately, during those days, it wasn't uncommon for medicines to contain opium or cocaine. And like Wallace Reed, one could get hooked on them. Mabel was also self-medicating, says Minta Durfee in an interview. Whether it was because of illness, severe coughing spells, which caused her lungs to hemorrhage, or being hurt while completing stunts, she would say, oh, I better take my goop because I feel like I'm gonna have a little hemorrhage. Minta would tell her to rest and maybe not shoot for a day or don't go into work that day. Mabel would say, oh no, that's the way the schedule goes. No, I'll do it. Her health was obviously starting to worsen. Her voice and looks were also changing from the coughing spell and the self-medication she did to cure it. Also around this time, it is said that she was having an affair with Samuel Goldwyn and had possibly become pregnant and miscarried. It was also said that Goldwyn tried to curb her wild habits. Mabel was never one for being disciplined. She would not eat well and partied until the sun came up. This would keep her from respecting scheduled times for production, and she was often late to set. Only one of her films with Goldwyn has survived. What Happened to Rosa was a far superior film compared to the one she made with Senate. Unfortunately, the people wanted Senate's kooky Mabel and not the Goldwyn Mabel, whose roles for her were more in-depth. She was forced to leave the studio and in turn Goldwyn himself. Okay, so... She kicks Senate to the curb. Yes. He holds on to the film Mickey. Yes. For like a year. Mm -hmm. Do we know why? No, I don't. No, know. I know. Just sometimes things like that happen. They end up holding the film. Mm -hmm. So that's held for a year. Mm -hmm. She's sick of him, mm -hmm. and goes to Samuel Goldwyn. Yes. And at that point, 
Mickey's released and everyone loves it. Yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. is Mickey the one that was the first film for a comedic lead? Yes. The only comedic the, lead? A comedic lead, billing for a comedic lead. For a, a billing for a comedic mm -hmm. lead. And Chaplin wouldn't get that for like three, three years, years after. Three years after. Three years after. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now she's with Goldman. Mm-hmm. And during this time, she's sick. Mm-hmm. And at this point, she kind of gets hooked onto like opiates and other types of drugs because of what was used to help her with her ailments? Yes. Okay. Because medication at that time, a right. lot of them did contain these things that you would never have now. And they would get hooked. Right. Because and they was... needed to keep, they had to keep filming going. Right. And I feel like that's still a problem even today. Like, oh, you yeah. always hear about, okay, well, here, this is the painkillers you're on because you got injured because they want their actors, like, back on set. Or even the actors themselves are pushing themselves to be back on mm -hmm. set. So they're taking this stuff and they're getting hooked. So it's so crazy, like, a hundred years later, almost, that, like, this is still happening. Oh, yeah. Um, so she's on that. The fact that she called it goop? Goop. Oh, That's what Minta God. Derpy called a goop. Minta Derpy would call it, call it, she'd call it a goop. So she would take that mm -hmm. and she would still, she'd not, she wouldn't take any breaks. No. But because of all her party and stuff like that, she was late, late all to the set. time. Yeah. Okay, she was late to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just so crazy. It's funny how it's just such a, a turn from her. Um, and it, I mean, it, it pretty much stems from what happened with Senate, I, I feel, right? Yeah, I think she was very tired. She yeah. was exhausted by it, you know, the constant over, working. Yeah. He was overworking her. He wasn't paying her well because it w it's been said also that uh, that Senate knew she wasn't very good with money. So, you know, oh she didn't God. really understand money, you know, or ways to save it or yeah. how much she was actually worth. So he oh took God. advantage of that. Like, okay, I know this sounds crazy, but is it possible like, like Senate asked her, asked to marry her just to keep her? I mean, there's always the possibility, like, I'm but I like, really do really think that there was, or? I really do believe that he did love her. That he did In his own way, okay. probably. Okay. But, you know, he was also a man, kind of like Chaplin, who wanted control and wanted everything to be done a certain way, and this is right. how it's going to be. And he knew, you know, what her, her strengths were and her weaknesses, and she was not good with money. I think in one book I read years and years ago, um, and forgive me if I'm wrong, I believe she had checks. Um from, you know, her working that mm -hmm. were in, like, a box that she hadn't even cashed. Because oh, she's like, you know, what do I do with it? This, what is this? It's a nice piece of paper, you know? Oh, I mean, I'm not... And she was also young. I mean, she didn't oh, move right. yeah. to California until she was, like, 17, 18, 18 maybe. When wow. That's when she left Biograph. So she was, you know, she was encouraged. She was still really, really She was young, young and yeah. didn't really know. She just... Work I, to and, make money to yeah. help her family, and that's basically what she did. And I imagine her parents probably weren't much about teaching her anything like that, or probably she probably not. didn't see any financial responsibility from them either. So. Well, no, because you know all the money went right to taking care of the family because yeah. you know they needed it. They weren't making a lot, so yeah. yeah so it's 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 just unfortunate, yeah. and you know maybe at this time also she, you know she just got tired like we said from all the working she was yeah. exhausted but maybe she finally realized that she was worth something yeah and that she wasn't going to put up with it and she was going to find somebody else who would help her yeah. and you know give her more before her release though goldwyn lent mabel to senate to make molly o senate wanted to bring back the innocent but wacky mabel to the screen and although the print no longer exists of this film it is said to have been well received by the public and reviewers alike. A month before the release of Molly O, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle would be charged with rape and manslaughter. Mabel believed in her friend, and when he was acquitted, Mabel was sure that he would be back on screen in no time. In an interview with the press, Mabel went on to say, Thank heaven that that jury vindicated Roscoe. His fame will only be greater now. I'm glad they went out of their way to place a stamp of approval on him. Even though he was acquitted after three trials, his career was essentially over. Roscoe had been convicted in the court of opinion. Hollywood would now have the eye of the Hayes Commission watching over it to police the industry's films for morals and censor what they thought as wicked and vice. Senate held Molly O back until the storm subsided. When it was released, it was a smash hit, and Senate began to work on Mabel's next film, Susanna. 
At this time, Mabel was spending time with a Paramount director by the name of William Desmond Taylor. She enjoyed their close friendship. They would go to movies and nightclubs together. They discussed books and current events. Taylor taught her about literature. At Christmas, Taylor gave Mabel the complete works of Robert Browning. Whether the relationship was more than just platonic, I don't think we will ever really know. There was rumors that possibly Taylor wanted more out of the relationship, but Mabel defined their relationship in father-daughter terms. Taylor seemed to accept these terms. No matter what the relationship was, Taylor had Mabel's picture displayed in his house and in his pocket watch. The friendship would end on February 1st, 1922, when Mabel would be the last person to see him alive, besides his killer. Poor Mabel was smeared by the press, even though she was exonerated of any wrongdoing. Just by her name being connected with a scandal of this magnitude was enough for her standing with the public to drop, as it had for her friend Arbuckle. It also didn't help that actress Mary Miles Minter would make statements about Mabel and her supposed romance with Mr. Taylor. Why would she do this to Mabel? Was she jealous of Taylor's relationship with her? Was she trying to keep the blame away from her and her family, who were also implicated as possible suspects? Whatever the reason was, poor Mabel had to publicly grieve her beloved friend while trying to maintain her public image and career. The newsmen continued to hound Mabel. At the brink of collapse caused by the scandal, Max Sennett halted work on Susanna and hid Mabel away in a cottage in Altadena, Pasadena. She stayed for a month or so until things began to quiet down and her health had been restored. She returned back to work on Susanna, where of course she once again got hurt on the job, this time being hurt by two little bears. Mabel wore a wide leather belt, and it was covered in honey. The bear soon took bait and began to lick her waist and paw at the belt. One bear was able to get its claws inside the belt and began to claw her. She yelled to her director, Richard Jones, that she was being killed, and his reply was, Be brave, my girl. Don't weaken. It's the best shot in the picture. She was out for a week to rest and recoup from the scratches. Arbuckle gets charged with rape and manslaughter. Mm -hmm. Mabel's not wrapped up into this scandal. Not at all. But she is speaking on his side. Yes. Okay, she is on his side, doesn't believe this could happen. He gets acquitted. Yes. He's free to go. All charges dropped. Mm -hmm. Mabel's happy. She's like, your star is going to shine brighter now. Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. But not. But it doesn't happen. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. The public oh, no. wants nothing to do with him. Yes. Okay. So she doesn't do any, she doesn't work with him at all at this point. At this point, I don't believe so, no. No. Buster Keaton would have him come on and direct under a different name. Yes. But nobody, nobody can touch him. There's nothing they can do to help Arbuckle. Right. And she is with, she's back with Senate, working yes. with Senate, because mm -hmm. she left Goldwyn. Yes. And she's working with Senate, and the Hayes Commission, mm -hmm. censorship, all that stuff, starts coming down on hard on Hollywood. Yes. So the movie Suzanne that Senate's working on mm -hmm. gets halted. He stops it. Well, he stops it because of the the William Desmond Taylor. Oh, that's right. So I keep for okay. So we have our buckle. She gets through that, mm -hmm. and now the scandal with her director friend friend friend, friend right yeah friend William Desmond Taylor because yes. he is shot and killed and. As we know, mm -hmm. she was the last to see him alive. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the press just has a field day on her. Mm -hmm. And it's not made any better because Mary Miles Minter, who also worked with William Desmond with Taylor, William Desmond who Taylor. we all know did have a crush. Very much so. Had a huge crush on Taylor. Mm -hmm. Starts saying things about her to the press. Yes. <laughs> like, she just can't, like, I feel like from 1916 on, she, she just can't, can't win. A, she can't win. No. She can't get a break. She can't win. So, even though the fact she's cleared mm -hmm. of any wrongdoing, yeah. she's still, public opinion-wise, 
not, everyone still thinks she might have done something or had something to do with it. Well, she's involved in a scandal. Whether or not she did, she's still, you know, a part of it. Her name will always be a part of it. Even if they say, no, she didn't do anything, she's still stuck, you know. And, I mean, I'm sure it also didn't help that she was probably thought of even with our Buckles trial because who did he work with? He worked with Mabel. I mean, he also obviously at that time um, had been working. He'd been doing shorts and things with Buster and Al St. John and they were, they had gone off, you know, to do their own thing. But, you know, Fatty and Mabel, we all know those shorts. So I'm sure in the back of people's minds are like, Oh my gosh. gosh. Yeah, what she is going on? She just this Arbuckle thing, and then now, you know, yeah. she's, this happens. And we're thinking, oh my God, she's in another scandal. Yeah. What is wrong right. with these people? <laughs> you know, and that's also when the, before that, the Hayes office was coming, you know, in to save the day, feeling that there was issues with Hollywood. Um, they well, felt Hollywood was immoral to it them. It was very yeah. immoral. So. And so, I mean, it doesn't help that... You know, we had, before all of this happened, we had all of Thomas dying. Yeah. So that happened. And then we have now, we have Arbuckle. So that's bad. And then we have William Desmond Taylor. That's bad. She's affiliated with two of the three scandals that have been going on. So, right. you know, I yeah. don't blame the public. I'd be a little like, what's <laughs> happening there? You know, what's right. really going on there? So, And yeah. so Senate, he halts the work on he Suzanne. He halts what work on Suzanne to get her away because no matter where she goes, she leaves her house. There's newsmen. Yeah. And even if she gives statements, she wants to give statements. She wants to be exonerated. They'll look for something else to, you know, tie her into something. Like, okay, well, maybe you didn't do this, but you did this. And you knew him right. with this. And, oh, did you have love letters? You know, I mean, it was kind of... Yeah. all over the place so she wouldn't be able to win the eyes of the press and it just you know unraveled from there so she needed to get away and like how we were speaking before i believe this kind of shows senate besides wanting to protect his property of Susanna and yeah. the work he's doing he did care about her he got her away right so i mean there is a a love there maybe it's now a love of a friendship right. or whatever, but, but he's he still, did care he is for her. At, he is he's watching out for her because it yeah. seems like nobody else is. But then she gets mauled by two bears, and two then baby she gets bears. Mauled by two bears. Well, that was the director's fault because he yes. wasn't paying attention. Yes. Um, and then she gets mauled by two baby bears. Like I can't, like <laughs> you can't even, like how can this even be real? I mean, this should be a this should be a movie. Yeah. This well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it should be a movie in general, but just the idea of these kind of things happening, it feels like. It feels like a comedy that you would see our Buckle or Keaton in, you know. It, right. It's just, it's sad, but it's funny at the same time. You know, I mean, this, like, it's how absurd. much more? I will absurd. Say, okay, that's I look, a better I word. I would say absurd. I don't want to say funny. funny Cause, yeah, because I would say it's absurd. Not, yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Mm-hmm. Mauled by two baby bears. Yeah. The movie did well at the box office, even with the Taylor scandal still in the minds of many. After Suzanne, Mabel went to Europe for some relaxation and fun during the summer of 1922 and returned in September to New York for a few weeks. Finally, she was back in Hollywood. Senate told her that he had a fine comedy for her. The extra girl was up next for Mabel. She found out, though, that Senate had tested six other actresses for the role before her. To make it up to her, Mabel told him that he would have to pay her $3,000 a week and a percentage of the profits. As in most films, Mabel would once again get hurt, and once again it would be director Richard Jones' fault. In a scene that called for a lion to be walked around the set by Mabel's character, the director, who was holding a pitchfork, stumbled over a box and the clatter startled the lion. Before Mabel knew what happened, she felt hot breath of the lion on her neck, and when she tried to move, she found herself being clawed by the beast. When the director tried to use the pitchfork on the lion, he mistakenly stuck Mabel instead. The movie was finished and ready for release at the end of 1923. She hadn't been feeling well through the end of the production and would need to get an operation after the Christmas holiday. She got mauled by a lion and then got stabbed with a pitchfork. Mm-hmm. That's it. I've got nothing. Hmm. 
Mabel had no idea she was headed for another scandal that would rock her life. Right before Christmas, Mabel entertained her friend Edna Perfiance and her friend Cortland S. Dines at her home. Dines was the son of a Denver oil millionaire. They had been to some of the same parties and she had joined him and Edna on his yacht. On New Year's Eve, Mabel had been invited to a lovely dinner at Senate's home. The next day she would receive a call from Edna Proviance saying that Dines had been at a wild New Year's Eve party the night before at the Ambassador Hotel and that he was feeling rather low. Edna hoped that Mabel would be able to go over to Dines' place and cheer him up. Mabel told Edna she was going into the hospital the next morning for an operation, but she relented and she had her driver, Joe Kelly, take her over to Dines' apartment. When she got there, she saw Dines and Edna, and being sweet Mabel was able to cheer him and Edna up. They spoke about the gift Mabel had for him at her house and that he had forgotten the last time he was there. She called home and asked for the present to be brought over and to take her home so she could rest before the operation. When Kelly, her driver, arrived, he handed the package to Dines and walked over to Mabel saying that it was time to go home. Edna was in the other room getting changed. Dines spoke up to Kelly saying, Say, Kelly, where do you get that stuff asking my guests to leave my house? Get out of here and down in that machine where you belong. Kelly berated Dines for keeping Mabel away from home for so long while she was going into the hospital the next morning. Mabel scolded Kelly, and suddenly, the men moved closer to each other and the sound of shots being fired. Kelly turned and ran out, and Dines staggered back and fell to the floor. He said to her, My God, Mabel! Can you imagine that hophead shot me? For God's sake, you and Edna get out of here quick as lightning. Go on, never mind me. Either of you, get out of here before the law arrives. Before they could, the police did arrive. Kelly raced to the Wilshire police station. He was locked up and said that he reacted in self-defense. He said Dines reached for a bottle to brain him. Dines was taken to the hospital and Edna and Mabel were questioned for hours. Dines was not seriously hurt. One bullet entered one side of his stomach and the other grazed his head. Of course, the newsmen came running and they actually dug up that Joe Kelly was actually not Joe Kelly, but Joe Greer. I have also found that his name may have also been Horace Greer. He escaped from a chain gang in Oakland, California after doing 15 days of his 75-day sentence. He was a cocaine addict and according to the court-appointed psychiatrist, had a spiritual love for Mabel and was motivated be a delusion to protect her. Dines made a full recovery and stated that he had way too much to drink to remember what happened. He didn't want to press charges and was ready to forgive and forget. So that's crazy. Of course, it's crazy. Um, and I can't help but the, get this sense of, like, almost like a comparison to William Desmond Taylor. So William Desmond Taylor changes his name. He's not who he's supposed to be. And now her driver also has a different name and a criminal past. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying Taylor had a criminal past. Who knows? But we do know there was some mysterious stuff happening. Mm -hmm. And he is like her spiritual protector. Well, he thinks so. He thinks that. Well, yeah, he thinks that he's a spiritual pro yeah. spiritual protector. Mm -hmm. I mean, may, and obviously, William Desmond Taylor also had that kind of protecting thing over her as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I just can't believe that Mabel Norman is involved, gets involved in this. You can't. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it's horrible. But, it's horrible. You know. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, right. But it's like, like, I don't even want to say like, what are the odds? But for her, for one thing, for one thing. For her, she has an operation the next day. Mm -hmm. I don't know who goes and parties the night before. Because it sounds like a party, right? No, she actually, it was just a nice dinner. It was just she a nice dinner. She got home relatively at a good time. She woke up around noon because Edna was calling her. Okay. Yeah, so it wasn't like a party party, you know, okay. like a so Mabel kind went, of party. It over. was just a nice okay. dinner with uh, at Max Senate's with probably a few other friends. But it wasn't anything, you know... And Dines was upset because the driver didn't know his place. Yes. Cocky. <laughs> Go ahead. 
In the fall of 1924, Mabel went down to Coronado Beach in San Diego to visit some friends. One day she went horseback riding when the horse began to run away and threw Mabel off. She was hurried to Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles. Mabel stated in an interview, while I was there, all wound up in plaster and tape, a Mrs. Georgia W. Church decided to sue her millionaire husband, Norman W. Church, for divorce. She accused him of many things, and in her petition was a paragraph in which it was said that I spent a lot of time visiting Mr. Church, who was quite ill in the hospital. I drank some of his liquor, and that I passed the time with him and the nurses telling a lot of spicy stories. Inasmuch as I was unable to move because of all my bandages, a fact that the hospital attaches quickly substantiated, I called up some lawyers and told them to take action against Mrs. Church. The hospital also planned to protect its reputation by proving in court that such visiting between rooms was impossible in the first place and would not be tolerated in the second. My lawyers then threatened to sue the woman for $500,000 unless she withdrew the offending paragraph from her petition. I certainly didn't want any more attention from the press, so I at once switched lawyers and my new ones went about it less spectacularly. Mrs. Church retracted the charges involving me and of course I declined to press civil action. Mabel needed a break. She met with a man by the name of Al Woods, who wanted her to play the lead in a play called A Kiss in the Taxi. She signed a contract for $1,500 a week plus 10% of the gross receipts. She went to New York in the summer of 1925 to start rehearsals. When she arrived, she found out that she was no longer in A Kiss in the Taxi, but in a completely different play entitled The Little Mouse. This play had gone under a few other names, and each time it was a failure. The critics were able to tell what it was, yet another try to resurrect an awful play, and they hated it all over again. The production was a disaster, and Mabel refused to go on with the play. Woods released her from her contract, and Mabel went back to California. It was 1926, and Mabel signed a three-year contract with Hal Roach. Her first film was Raggedy Rose, followed by One Hour Married, The Nickel Hopper, and Should Men Walk Home? In September of the same year, Mabel was giving a dinner for a few friends at her Beverly Hills home. One of her guests called her to say he would not be able to attend. Mabel needed to find somebody else to occupy that dinner seat. She called her friend of over 15 years, Lou Cody, to see if he would be able to come. He told her yes, and what a party it would be. After midnight, the party was still going on, and Lou thought it would be a funny joke to stage an old-time melodrama proposal to Mabel, and she thought it would be a good idea if they were to really get married. So off they went to Ventura County, where they were married by Judge Tom H. Milland, who was still in his pajamas. When they returned home, Lou went back to his own house. I like the fact that the fa even though she was getting involved in like another scandal or was mm -hmm. forced into another scandal, this time it seemed like she fought more yeah, against it. she did. Instead of trying to just go with it or whatever like mm -hmm. that or take the licks, she actually fought against this. Mm -hmm. The weird thing though is the fact that she fell off a horse in San Diego, and they rushed her to a hospital yeah, in Los Angeles. That's what I was thinking too. That is very odd. That doesn't make much sense to me. No. Um, but lots of things that are happening during the nineteen, the early days of Hollywood don't make much sense to me. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was like a celebrity thing that she'd be taken care of better in Los Angeles. I don't know, but that seems very odd. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that seems very strange about me about yeah. that case is the fact that. She was in that hospital because she fell off a horse in San Diego. Yeah, and it's, it is odd, but it's not anything I feel I haven't heard before. Right. Especially at that yeah. time. I believe that was the same thing that happened with uh, Ince when he was shot. I believe oh that when they took him off the boat, you know, secretly took him off the boat, they drove him almost like, I can't remember where That's it was right. at, but they drove a long way to get him back home, 
you know. Yeah, they brought him right to bed, right? Yeah, they put him in bed. So, I mean, it's not far-fetched, I guess, at this time. My, my gosh. To Hollywood and really celebrity. Long way. That's so, just so crazy. It's really weird. I, I also, when I was doing the research, I didn't understand that because I'm like, they're, I mean, San Diego, it's it's a big city. I'm sure they have I'm a hospital. I'm sure they have yeah. a hospital, but there, there must have maybe there, maybe there was she. I'm sure she did probably go to a hospital in San Diego, and at some point maybe made her. Maybe way, they moved her back, moved over, her back there. over there. Yeah, there. maybe they felt she was fine to be able to make the journey. Yeah. I'm just curious it. on how banged up she was. If she's quoted as saying like she's all her, plastered, it kind of yeah. makes me think she's like, like in a yeah, cast, exactly. like completely out. You know, yeah. That's just nuts. Yeah. And so she meets Luke Cody, mm -hmm. and like right out of a silent comedy. They get married, mm -hmm. and the judge is in pajamas. Yes. <laughs> and I do believe, I think, um, the judge's daughter, like, she might have been 16, was, like, witness to the That to is the, I was going to ask if there was a witness. There had to be at least Oh, yeah, there was definitely like a witness. I just don't remember if, like, the party all went, you know, like, hey, let's go to Ventura. Let's get married, you know, <laughs> if it was that kind of thing. Oh, that's hilarious. That's funny. I wonder. You know, I'm not positive continued. if yeah. it continued all the way to Ventura. To the judge's house. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, I want to say it's so great. It's going to be such a happy ending, and it's just not. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not going to be happy. Poor thing. In January of 1927, Mabel became ill with bronchial trouble and in February was taken to Santa Monica Hospital with double pneumonia. She remained there for almost 10 weeks and spent the summer and fall recuperating. In 1928, she and Lou Cody would live together and Mabel was involved in another fight, but this one was for her life. Mabel had tuberculosis and her physicians believed it was fatal. In late 1929, Mabel would be taken to Pottinger's Sanatorium in Monrovia and would stay there for months. In the early morning of February 23, 1930, with only her secretary, Miss Julie Benson, and a nurse by her side, Mabel passed away. In one of the articles announcing her death, the title of the piece was, To Live Until Confessions Solved Murder of Taylor. Quoting from the article, as far back as a month before her death yesterday, she told the district attorney's office investigators, I hope to God that before I die, they find the slayer of William Desmond Taylor. They say they know I didn't do it, yet they always want to question me about it. Articles at this time also revealed that Mabel's father had died three weeks before she had, but no one told her due to her weakened state. On February 28th, Mabel's funeral service was held at the chapel of Cunningham and O'Connor, and her body was interned at Calvary Cemetery. Honorary pallbearers were Sid Grauman, D.W. Griffith, Max Sennett, Charles Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, Ford Sterling, Eugene Paulette, Samuel Goldwyn, Paul Byrne, U.S. District Attorney Judge James, and Colonel Art Goble. An excerpt from an article in New Movie Magazine sums up, I feel, the life and legacy of Mabel. It says, it wasn't a funeral. It was just a farewell. No one was ever so loved as Mickey. She hasn't died. She lives forever in the hearts of us, whom she gave love, courage, sympathy, and tolerance. It's just sad. I it mean, is sad. I know a lot of people died of tuberculosis during mm -hmm. that time. I know that it was it was a common illness. Mm -hmm. um, but for her life just to end that way, I don't want to say that maybe things were starting to come together. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, she just got married. Mm -hmm. It didn't sound like there was. I mean, I, I'm not sure if there was. She was going to continue with Hal Roach, mm -hmm. or what was going to happen with her next moves were. But it just sounds like it came to a point where maybe she was going to be okay. Yeah, it does sound like she was going to be okay. I believe, you know, she may have gone on to do more work with Hal Roach, but I think she realized that due to her illness, that obviously was not going to get any better. It didn't seem like it was going to get better. She needed 
time. She needed time to rest, to actually try to recoup, yeah. even though she had tried it several times with other ailments right. and that. There was no point in trying to keep going with it. So I think she wanted to take time, spend it with her new husband. And I do believe that they did love each other. That Besides being friends, I do believe that they they did care very much for one another. Um, I think she just she just needed time. And obviously time wasn't on her side. It's just so crazy. Mm -hmm. So now tell me about Mary Miles Minter. <laughs>